Will Kaufman. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the. Um, <laughs> thanks for staying. <laughs> uh, where were we? We were, we were we were trying to get past the uh, bum blockade into the state of California because the police had set up this illegal uh, thing there to stop all the migrants from coming in. Right. Well, we know that Woody did make it into the state of California past the bum blockade, and it was there that he encountered for the first time the word "oki." Oki. This was a slur. It was an insult being used to describe all of the migrants from the Dust Bowl region, whether in fact they were from Oklahoma or not. I mean, some people might make a distinction, you know, between Okies and Arkies from Arkansas or something like that, you know. If you came from Texas, they may call you Tex. <clears throat> but basically, the formula went like this. If you were poor, white, homeless, unemployed, and in California at that time, you were an Okie, no matter where you came from. <coughs> Funnily enough, if you were poor, black, homeless, unemployed, in California at that time, and from Oklahoma, you weren't an Okie. Okay? Okies were a particular white underclass. And they were the target of a really hysterical, highly orchestrated campaign of statewide xenophobia, you know, backed up by this huge anti-migrant block that I told you about, you know, the Los Angeles Times and Hearst and all that. <coughs> so it's a, it's a situation like where, say you went to a, a, a movie theater somewhere in Bakersfield or somewhere in the San Joaquin Valley, you'd be met with a sign outside saying, uh, Colors and Okies upstairs. At least one um, diner is on record known to have posted a sign that said, no coloreds, dogs, or Okies served here. Right? So, you know, you didn't, you didn't have money to go to the movies, but if you did find a nickel and then you went upstairs into the balcony with, you know, all the other outcasts, you know how before, like over here, before the, the main features, they would show the newsreels, you know? And these newsreels would be screaming at you. They're seedy and shiftless. They're overrunning the state. They're here for the benefit gravy train. You know, we must do something about the oaky migrant hordes, you know? They're genetically and intellectually inferior and subnormal. They should be sterilized voluntarily or otherwise. The oaky hordes, you know... Daily Mail kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, like they've always been saying about, about migrants, right? Well, it's in that context that Woody began to circulate around the migrant camps about 1938 because he was also a budding journalist and his boss sent him into the migrant camps. He was from Oklahoma, so he figured that Woody would be able to report back on the conditions that he saw. This is really the beginning of his political education, I think. And again, you know, because he, he, he began to listen to the old radicals, the old hobos, sitting around the campfire talking about the big picture. And again, as Joe Klein, his biographer, word describes it, says, uh, these old hobos would mutter half coherently about the capitalists, the rich bastards, and, and then they'd reach into their pocket and pull out a battered old red card that proved they had been members of the wildest, wooliest, most violent, joyous, and completely disorganized gang of reds ever to strike fear into the hearts of the American bourgeoisie. <laughs> the industrial workers of the world. The IWW. The... The Wobblies in front of the class, right? I don't know why he uses the past tense. That's um, my membership card that I was just waving at you. We've been trying real hard since about 1905 to put things right. A lot of, a lot of people think that the Wobs were wiped out in the Great Red Scare of 1919, 1920, but we weren't wiped out. We just went underground to wait for the invention of the internet. <laughs> So it's iww.org if you want to join the other six of us who are still out there. If I, I pay my dues by direct debit these days. 
Anyway, the old wobs, they infected Woody with their humor, with their cynicism, with their anger, with their political non-alignment, but I think more than anything with the songs that they sang out of their little red song book to fan the flames of discontent. And I was so lucky to have just been handed a copy of the Wobbly song book just now by, I don't, I, well, I don't know where you are, but thank you. Oh, right there, thank you so much for that. And um, so I've just been given this, this copy as well. And now, um, there are a lot of songs in the IWW songbook that, I don't know, you've probably heard on, on picket lines of your choice. Uh, I think a lot of them, some of them don't quite, uh, they're kind of like, you know, Edwardian and exhortative. Some of them don't quite, you know, like, Arise, ye prisoners of starvation. I don't think that quite cuts it on a modern picket line, personally. I don't want to insult anybody here. But things like Solidarity Forever, that's in there. But I think, I think of, you know, the, the songs that Woody would have loved by far would have been the 26 uh, pricelessly funny parodies of popular tunes, religious tunes, and old folk tunes written by this fella. Anyone know who he is? There you go, Joe Hill. A lot of people, you know, don't know who he is, but they know the song, I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night. They all sang it and they don't know who he was. He was a um, Swedish-born immigrant to the United States. He was in the Wobblies, a great songwriter, great musician, multi-instrumentalist. He could play any instrument he, he put his hands on. A labor, um, you know, agitator, organizer for the Wobblies. Uh, he was, he was born someplace in Sweden, and um, his, his, I think his, his birth name was Joel Emanuel Hagelund, and then he shortened it to Joseph Hillstrom, and then that even he got further shortened to Joe Hill. And so he became a martyr to the cause of American labor with his execution on a trumped-up murder charge in the state of Utah in 1915. And students of American labor history will know of the stirring telegram that he sent to the Wobblies the night before his execution. He said, don't waste time mourning. Organize. The really famous line in American labor history. Fewer people will probably be aware that he also said this in the same telegram. Basically, he said, can you do me a favor when this is all over? Promise me that you'll get my body across the state line, because I don't want to be caught dead in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what happened to him. Uh, he was cremated at a huge funeral service in Chicago, the Wobbly uh, headquarters, IWW headquarters. I think about 20 or 30,000 people came to his funeral. And then his ashes were divided up and put into little envelopes and sent to the different IWW chapters all around the world. Apparently about 25 years ago, Billy Bragg got a hold of a little morsel of Joe Hill's ashes and washed them down with a ceremonial pint. <laughs> Anyway, the year before his death, Joe Hill wrote a political pamphlet, no matter how good, it's never read more than once, but a song is learned by heart and it's repeated over and over and over. And that's kind of the first lesson that he taught Woody Guthrie from beyond the grave. And we know that Woody did carry the, the, the songbook in his breast pocket when he was out there in California. And the second thing Joe Hill said was this, he said, Take a few cold, common sense facts, um, put them into a song, and then wrap them up in a cloak of humor to take the dryness off of them. And I think Joe Hill's reworking of the old Salvation Army hymn, In the Sweet By and By, is a pretty good case in point. Some of you may know that song, you know, In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Well, now the Sally Army, and the Wobblies were mortal enemies. They would stake out, probably because they were both singing movements, <laughs> right? So they would stake out opposite um, street corners. The Sally Army would have their brass bands and their drums, and the Wobblies would have their fiddles and string bands and accordions and stuff, and they'd try to outshout and outsing each other down. The whole idea was that the, you know, the Sally Army was sort of you know, trying to set it up for the afterlife, and the Wobblies were more interested in sort of fixing things like down here on the ground. So that's kind of how, um, that's kind of how Joe Hill saw it. And there are some people who think that the real reason that he was executed, and I'm not sure that I'm not one of them, was for writing what did become the anthem to American labor in the first half of the 20th century, the preacher and the slave. Huge influence on Woody. Come out 
every night They try to tell you what's wrong and what's right But when asked how about something to eat They will tell you when you are They'll answer in a voice that's so sweet Sorry. You will eat by and by In that glorious land up in the sky Work and pray and live on hay Cause you'll get pie in the sky when you die Holy rollers and jumpers they all They say, cause he will cure all diseases today. Yes, in that starvation army they will play. And they'll sing and they'll clap and they'll pray. Until they get all of your coin on their drum. And then they'll tell you when you are on the children and my wife and try to get something good in this life then I'm a sinner and a bad man they tell when I die I will sure go to hell you will leave by and by in that glorious land of in the sky It'll do you good.